All right, folks, welcome to week two, our live lecture. Today I'm going to talk about segmentation and positioning and the marketing mix and the promotional mix. So this is kind of like building block stuff. There are so many almost weaponized digital tools available now for us to get super granular and get exactly in front of the face of the customer that we want. Um, so that stuff is really good, but we have to back up and really look at, are we even talking to the right person? Do we have the right product? So segmenting is making sure that we're getting to the right who. The marketing mix is what we're gonna sell them. And then the promote, promotional mix is kind of how we're going to sell that person. So I'm going to take about 20 minutes to kind of layer these up for you. And then we'll break into um, uh, an exercise. So this question, what is a copywriter? Good question. Anybody want to answer that one? If they feel like they got the answer, you can unmute. Raise your hand if you want to do that. Anyone? Jared, go ahead. Or are you just ruffling your mic? All right, well, I'll take it then. Oh, right. uh, go. What was the question? What is a copywriter? Uh, somebody who um, basically copyrights something for somebody so they can get royalties from it. A lot of people think that, and there is copywriting. So the copywriter is an old term. Like, you basically, you write advertising words, copy, um, on behalf of clients. So... It's persuasive ad copy language, and it goes back from when there was a lot of print and, and newsletters, like we need to put the copy in here. So it's, it's advertising language, it's writing copy. Now we'd call you a content, a content writer uh, would be the equivalent of that. So that is a copywriter. Share screen, good questions. And forgive me if I missed something in the chat, let me know, because uh, I got a lot of windows open. And here we go. Beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna minimize this so I can see more. I'm gonna get us up to the top. All right, you guys are good? Excellent, if not, unmute and just let me know. So you can go to the week two resource page and I always post this lecture without uh, me talking. It's just slides only, Google slides only, and all the links work in there. So this is an example of one of those uh, free digital certifications. Google's got a pretty robust platform. It's called Google Digital Garage, and you can train yourself and get certified on digital marketing. They've got a lot of good content. Plus, I think the, the narrator is British, so it's kind of a cool accent to listen to. Copy Segmentation in target markets are what we're going to talk about today. Okay, Let's get into the copy piece. Okay. So compelling copy. The old school, when I was your guys' age, uh, the marketing professors were talking about AIDA, attention, interest, desire, and action. And here's Ariana kind of playing that out with a song. I see it, I like it, I want it, I got it. Attention, interest, desire, action. And that was the model for copywriting for decades. And that model is starting to phase out and we're moving more into what we call this quote, storytelling format. And those of you who are in the digital space, you probably heard that term, but you know, attention, interest, desire, and action is some kind of grabby headline. And then you talk about the features and benefits of the product that's gonna get them excited. And then you have a call to action where they can actually call a phone number, or go to a website, and actually make the purchase. So that piece is a little, is, is not being used quite as much. Here's a classic example of a print ad. Uh, don't replace, regrow. This is regenerative cell therapy for knee replacements. Um, so there's the attention getting headline, and then some interest with the subhead to talk about the features and the benefits. And you can see at the bottom, they've got a 1-800 number for a call to action. So that's AIDA. And there's still a fair amount of copy that's being written that way. But what we're seeing now, and I'll share some other examples of new copy strategies as the weeks go by, is this storytelling format. And there's Simon Sinek. He's a business speaker. He's all over YouTube. Um, 
and he's got this platform that talks about uh, the golden circle and starting with why. And I'm going to see if this works when we actually play it because I think it's, it's pretty short. But basically his theory is people don't buy what you do as a company. Hey, we are Apple and we make these types of products with these specs. Instead, they want to buy why you do it. Tell me why you do what you do. And I want like an emotional connection to the company. So let's, let's actually listen to this video and I'm going to check my chat to make sure that you guys can hear this video. All right, I'm gonna play it. But this little line. So he's talking about kind of our cognitive process for buying products. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand. I'm just checking that you guys, this uh, audio is working. Yeah. Okay, sorry to interrupt. I just, you know, I, I, you're blind to me when I run the videos. <laughs> I want to make sure it's working. Okay, good. Now he's going to give an actual example of Apple. And what he's talking about is people don't buy what you do, product and features and benefits. They buy why you do it. So we'll listen to his example here. The stand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, Hold on, let me crank up the volume a little bit. It seems like it's a little low. You might get blasted, so prepare to turn down your volume if you need to. A marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. 
They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. And Dell, Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. When we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures. It just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do, and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you, or more importantly, be loyal? Okay. So I'm gonna stop that here, and <clears throat> let me copy these questions for you. And uh, so you have two questions here. I'm gonna put these into the chat have somebody raise their hand if they think they have the answer to that. So this is an interesting kind of flip on how we write copy. If you think about your own experiences, oftentimes I'm sure there's things where you've just like short circuited and you had to buy something, and then you rationalize it later, right? So features and benefits rationalize why we buy something, but it doesn't get to that core essence of us of like why we do something. It's very similar to like why we fall in love with somebody. So we're, we're kind of getting to that piece. And so marketers are realizing that they need to shift their language and have a story about their business that is compelling. So go ahead and use the reaction button and raise your hand if you think you know the answer. Look at the first mission statement here in the chat. Bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. If you have a body, you are an athlete. Raise your hand with the reaction button down at the bottom if you think you know who that company is. Ooh, uh, Nike. Nike, that is correct, Karen. How about the second one? Build the best product. Cause no unnecessary harm. Use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Donnie, I see you got your hand up. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, that, that was for the last one. I was just playing with emojis. Oh, <laughs> okay. And you want to take you want to take it on or let's. Anybody else? Could you repeat that one more time? Yeah, it's in the chat. So build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. Oh man, that could be anybody. Maybe Patagonia? Patagonia it is. Ding, ding. Congratulations to Karen and Donnie for that. So in both of these companies, from a marketing standpoint, no big surprise, are super successful because they figured out this storytelling, they figured out their mission and how to have a stance that um, people can rally behind. So, so there's that piece is that storytelling piece. All right, so that's today's little um, copywriting lecture. I'm a couple minutes over on my time. So any quick questions on that? I'm sure we can think of other examples. Okay. Let's move into the lecture and I'm going to just to make sure the next thing I'm going to share is I'm going to get into segmentation. So I put down 25 minutes. I'm going to try to do it in about 20 minutes. So I might cut parts of this out, but when we talk about segmentation and you did this in your signup sheet, segmentation is looking at the sector that you're in from a very broad, what we call a broad generic product line basis. What's the sandbox that I'm playing in? not just your direct competitors, but 
okay, I'm in beverages, I'm in beer, you know, so that's kind of my segment. And then what are all the different players within there? So marketers oftentimes start by segmenting broad and then looking at all the different sectors to figure out based on our resources as a company and our you know, current brand status, what's the most appropriate niche for us to really go after. Um, and that's the segmentation strategy. So let's hit a few slides on that. Okay, share. Done. Whoops, present. Uh, this is just an example of the copywriting piece. I forgot to close off on this. So this is uh, a company, American Lithium Energy. They're in Carlsbad. They're a defense contractor. We uh, placed an intern in this company to do some marketing work and they got paid for it. And they're all engineers. Here's their existing copy about, they have these special batteries that don't catch fire, which is important if you're wearing a battery, battle tech as we call it, uh, and you get shot, uh, your vest, which is basically a battery can catch fire and that's bad for soldiers. So they developed a special technology that has a kill switch within the battery that shuts off if the battery starts to overheat. So here's their copy and I'm just gonna read it off real quick. And then working with the intern, um, we came up with some new copy for them and we basically kind of followed Simon Sinek's, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So here's what they started with and you can see it's what they do. Without any foreseeable slowdown in the global market, American Lithium Energy is extremely well positioned to become the global leader in the ever expanding energy storage sector. As the demand for safe lithium battery cells increases daily, ALE is constantly innovating new technology that produces high power, high energy lithium battery solutions while maintaining the critical safety components required by the US government and military. And if you're all yawning, that's because it's the what you do language. So we flipped it and we wrote some new copy. New copy. The trust of our military partners drives everything we do at American Lithium Energy. Our mission is simple, design and manufacture the best battery power solutions for military applications. More than the supplier, American Lithium Energy is your ally from design to execution. So you can see it's just a, it's a different take on that and uh, you know, a more compelling copy. All right, that was a fun you can check out American Lithium on your own. So we wrote a newsletter for them. They haven't launched it yet. So the three key items out of this week too, marketing mix, segmentation, and promotional mix. I'll probably get the first two, marketing and segmentation. We probably won't have time for promo mix. So you can look at that on your own. But let's dive right in to the marketing mix piece first. This is also called the four P's. They've been teaching this since I was your guys' age and going to San Diego State, the four P's of marketing, product, price, place, promotion. And companies tend to focus on one of these lanes, if you will, to kind of make themselves different in the marketplace versus competitors. So I can't see you guys, but I'll have you unmute. But for example, if you consider, we're gonna focus on new products, innovative products, that's one, differentiation strategy. You know, we're going to focus on price. That could be a low price strategy or even a high price strategy. We're going to focus on place, how we distribute the product, how we get it from manufacturer to consumer. Or we're going to have different promotion. We're going to have a different way of promoting our products. So Walmart, what would Walmart be? Somebody unmute and just shout it out so I know you can hear me. Price, low price. Definitely low price, low price strategy. From a marketing standpoint, when you pursue a low price strategy, you actually kind of can't do as much marketing because you're all about operational efficiency. Walmart's price. How about that? Uh, I think that's the Apple Watch in the upper left there. Somebody else unmute and give me that one. Product. Definitely product innovation. And we just saw with Apple, that's what they're all about. You know, keep coming up with innovative new products. That's how we're going to make ourselves distinct and different in the marketplace versus competitors. How about that weird looking um, vending machine? You can order a hot pizza uh, from a vending machine. Place. 
That's place. Yep. So that's how do we get the product from producer to consumer? Like, you know what? We're going to have vending machines instead of actual retail locations or even uh, um, pizza delivery. And then uh, in the bottom left there, you may not be familiar with it, but I'm sure you've all heard of Red Bull marketing powerhouse. And that's their flu tag competition where they have people uh, ride these contraptions off of a barge in an attempt to fly. <laughs> None of them can actually fly, but Red Bull gives you wings, right? So uh, this is a special event. So how do you think Red Bull differentiates itself in the marketplace? Promotion. Promotion. Okay. Exactly, guys. Yeah. And if you look at Red Bull versus some of the other energy drinks, not that you should be drinking energy drinks, they're horrible for you. Um, only in extreme hangover emergencies. But the uh, they do these special events and, you know, they have the whole Red Bull channel that is like super robust. They've done lots of stuff. In the upper right, you see Shave Club. So here they are doing the subscription model. You don't need to buy your razor and shaving and all that stuff, especially with millennials who love their beards. Um, you know, now we're going to actually go direct and, and it'll be shipped directly to you. You don't need to go to retail for that anymore. Same with cosmetics. So that's all a new place. So I really want to underscore this for you guys, because in week five, you're going to have your first step of your marketing plan. And we're not really opening up the marketing plan yet. You can look at it under the start here resource page, and you've got the major projects piece and it, it elaborates on the marketing plan. You're going to do the marketing plan in steps. The first thing you want to do is come up with your own product or service idea. And it doesn't have to be a crazy brand new product. Last semester I had a student, he's like, I'm gonna come up with a CBD dog treats. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, let's, look, let's Google it and see if it already exists. Oh, it's already out there. Um, most of them are already out there. But your new product or service idea doesn't have to just be a new product. I'm gonna give you an example. Let's take laptops. So maybe I'm like, all right, I'm looking at laptops as my sector and my category. I wanna come up with some type of new laptop product idea. If I was gonna focus on product to differentiate my laptops versus all the other laptops that are out there, I might go for solar powered laptop. The laptop itself is made of solar panels and it charges itself when you're out in the sun. Yes, there's already solar powered laptops out there, but that would be a potential um, new product idea. If I was gonna take laptops and go with these other marketing mix components, maybe I focus on place. Okay, laptops, you can order them online. That's how most of us get them. Students certainly need laptops when they're at school. Let's assume we don't have COVID-19 happening, but what if my new product idea is we're gonna have laptop kiosks on campuses and the student can walk up, swipe their card and a little laptop vending machine will spit out a laptop that you can borrow for a couple hours while you're at school. That would be a place, a new, a new product idea using place as, as the new way for that product. It could be um, pricing, which would go maybe hand in hand with those kiosks where it's a pay per use a uh, laptop purchase. You're not buying the hard laptop and then breaking it or spilling coffee on it. You just pay for it when you use it. So it's like a subscription model, pricing model for laptops. So that's using price as a different way of coming up with a new laptop idea. Or it could be promotion. So maybe I do a cross promotion with a publisher. And if you use one of our laptops, it comes with all the Cengage textbooks already loaded on the computer for free. And that would be a kind of a cross promotion piece. So this is just something to kind of put in the back of your head. Uh, as you guys start thinking about uh, product or service ideas, feel free to message me directly. Again, we don't start until week five. We still got three more weeks. But in the resource page, there's some great videos that I put together on how to come up with a product or service idea. You can check those out, but just know that it doesn't have to be a crazy brand new product idea. And I've had some students that have messaged me like, okay, I've got this awesome idea. You can't share it with anybody. In fact, I don't even want to share it to the class. What is it? And they'll tell me, I'm like, oh, it's already been done. <laughs> but, so, um, so have fun with it and feel free to message me about that piece. So that's the marketing mix, product, price, place, promotion. And most of what this class is going to focus on are these four disciplines. We'll talk about pricing strategies, distribution strategies, 
uh, the new product development process, which is what I used to do as a product manager for Jack in the Box. And then the promotion piece, which is advertising, public relations, direct sales, meaning sales people, um, or sales promotion, which is a broad category. All right, let me test your knowledge here on the bottom, and you can just unmute one at a time here. Oh, Zoom, you're not being nice to me. I'm gonna put you up here. Um, how about Tesla? Tesla as um, a new entrant, a disruptor in the automobile space. If you had to pick where you think they're doing uh, as far as what are they differentiating on, which one would you say? You can chat it as well, or you can unmute. I can't see you guys right now or the chat feature. Product. product, product for sure. Yeah, I'm hearing product. Yeah, definitely. Are they the only ones that have an electric vehicle? No, no. but they have the, they're like the most innovative vehicles and they're coming out with their, what is it? One million mile battery coming up soon. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. And their design, their design just kicks ass over the others. So if you look at the original, you know, Toyota Prius is like a tin can. You know, just no, in that same aspect, could we look at the PR arm of promotion for that as well with kind of Elon Musk's weird antics in, in the social space? <laughs> great. I would great, agree with that. Great point, Donnie. Absolutely. I would argue that Tesla um, is as much differentiating themselves on promotion as they are on product. So... Uh, Elon Musk gets a ton of PR coverage, SpaceX and his own personal antics, you know, and he's on Joe Rogan and he's doing bong hits. And so, you know, and so people kind of like that. So he's definitely certainly promotion. What about place? How do you, do they have the traditional dealer network for Teslas? Oh, they ship it to your house. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. So no, they, you, go ahead, Andrew, you go. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, they you order them. So you go to a, a retail store that's most likely located inside of a mall, which is not like a conventional uh, dealership. And then uh, you order the car. I don't know exactly the process within the store, but then they ship the car to your house. So Elon figured out, you know what, dealerships are expensive and, and they take a cut. Most car manufacturers, they actually manufacture the car and they sell it to the dealers and their profit the profit lane is done at that point and then the dealer marks it up and sells it to the final consumer. So he's gone direct, um, which enables him to, you know, keep more of the profits of selling the car. So um, good, good examples. So as you think about um, your product or service idea, you want to have kind of picking a main lane here on how you're going to differentiate yourself from the competition. So this requires you to step back and kind of look at the 10,000 foot view. Who are the players and how are they competing? And if you're trying to be like everybody else, then you're in that sea of sameness. And when you're a company that doesn't have a clear differentiation strategy, you're probably suffering a little bit in sales. And if you could look at uh, burger chains, there's so many. How is, for example, this is a large chain, Wendy's different than the other chains? What's their point of difference? I think it's, well, I thought it was product. I think it's product. How so? I, I think because of the way it's like, um, well, it's, I think it's too, too tiered there. Um, I think it's the, the, like, you know, fresh grilled burger. Um, I don't know a lot of people that like Wendy's, but it's, it's, <laughs> I believe the way that they promote or the, the product is, is like, it's a grilled, maybe it's promotion then actually. I'm so sorry. No, but, thanks Karen. And your confusion is appropriate because I would argue that, uh, <laughs> Wendy's does not have a clear differentiation strategy. Oh, God. Their, their, sales, their sales have suffered as a bit. So whereas you could look at somebody like In-N-Out, and when you guys think In-N-Out, what, what comes to mind when you think of, let, let me hear from one In-N-Out affectionado, like when you think of In-N-Out, what, what, what compels you to go there? There again, fresh made burger. I feel like I'm gonna get the old style. They just put the burger in the grill as soon as I order it. And as soon as I drive up, they, they have it there. Roger that. Okay. It must be fresh because I can see them making it right there. They put a window in. It's the same product as Jack in the Box and everybody else. It's the same six to one patty, six, six patties off one pound. Um, you know, it's, is it really that much more fresh? Uh, you know, arguably, maybe we don't know for sure, but it's a simple purist menu. If you just want a really good burger and shake, you can go in and out. If you want a bunch of other junk like breakfast and salads, 
you're going to go somewhere else. So, uh, and in and out doesn't do much marketing, but they've got a clear positioning. So we're kind of backing up and like looking, you can see like, if you're the marketer for a company, what you're working with and what you're handed as you, as you come in as a marketing person for that company, um, sometimes you have to kind of really rebuild the company and start doing things in a different way uh, versus trying to market a company that doesn't have a clear differentiation strategy. So one of your first building blocks is how are we going to differentiate which of the four P's of marketing are we going to hang our hat on and focus as our primary point of difference versus the competitors. Good stuff. Good conversations there. So when we segment, we start broad and we go to narrow. Broad, like the example here, beer, narrow, we're talking specific product category of non-alcoholic beer or gluten-free beer. But as a marketer, you start broad. What are all the lanes we want to go in? And and to figure out where you want to go, what fits your target market the best. So for example, here's, here's uh, cars. Sorry for my kind of cheesy clip art graphic. And, you know, American car manufacturers, part of Americana. But if you look at the main, the very first column of car types, we see we got micro cars and four-door sedans, entry-level sedans. We've got uh, convertibles, we've got roadsters and sports cars, we've got SUVs and we've got pickup trucks. Uh, and obviously we're missing electric because this clip art is pre-electric cars. Um, <laughs> so you can see this is some main product categories. Okay, that's great. And most car manufacturers have this. These, but what we really wanna think about are who are the customers that are buying these different types of cars. And that's really what segmentation is. So when you guys break into your groups today, I'm gonna to give you a broad sector like beer or lodging. And, and you're gonna start by kind of defining it um, by the user type. But when we typically talk about segmentation, we are describing segmentation using uh, uh, a targeting a specific, what we call target market, which is your ideal customer, your avatar customer, and describing that customer using demographics, age, income, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, where, and I know millennials and Gen Z, we don't like to label, be labeled, um, but it's kind of these cool, crude tools of marketers to kind of find out what's your main kind of demographics about you. And then also psychographics, which are attitudes, interests, opinions, like you're conservative or you're outdoorsy. Um, or I had a gay friend tell me like, you know, uh, there's all different types of gay men. And, you know, one category is uh, uh, bears, which are like masculine looking large men that are hairy, uh, but they're gay. Like, okay, I didn't know that one. So but that, that's a psychographic description, right? So most marketers, have a mix of demographics, age, income, gender, ethnicity, education levels, and psychographics. And these two are combined to describe your target market. So when you talk to a marketing director or manager at a company, hey, hey, tell me who's your, who's your target market? They're gonna rattle back a bunch of demos and psychos to you describing that customer. Okay. So if we went back to these cars, and let's just take two. Let's look at the micro car in the upper left, you know, like your smart cars or the Mini Cooper. You know, it's the kind of car that if it runs out of gas, you just throw it away. Um, and then in the bottom left, you have a small pickup truck, like an entry level pickup truck. Who's the customer for each of these? And I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a second because I need to see the chat. Pardon me for my Zoom moment. 
lost my screen. There it is, stop share, thank you. Oh, I moved it up there, okay. So I'm stop sharing for a moment here. Um, how about, and go ahead and type something in the chat or raise your hand if you want to answer. Take the mini car, describe who that person is using demographics and psychographics. So I see J.R. Cook, he's saying small car would be city dweller interested in efficiency. Good, that makes sense. There's certainly not a rural person. But that, and so JR, is that those descriptions that you gave me, city dweller, that's demographics, uh, interested in efficiency, that's a psychographic. What else? Anything else about a small, mini car? More likely woman. Yes, you could argue that maybe uh, for uh, straight males that a mini car might be a little emasculating for their sexual identity, so they're less likely to buy a, a mini car. Matt's saying a high school girl thinks that car is cute and mommy and daddy buy the princess anything. So is that, uh, Matt, is that demographics or psychographics you're using to describe that? I'd say it's spot on, but go ahead and unmute. Is that description psychographics or demographics? I wanna say demographics. Thank you, Matt. Um, the high school student, that part is a certain age, so that's demographics. Yeah. Um, Cute and mommy and daddy buy, that's more psychographics. Psychographics, okay. psychographics are attitudes, interests, and opinions, AIOs. Social, okay. media, social media enables us to target also psychographically at a level, level that we never could before. We used to only be able to buy media demographically, but now we can do both. Donnie said okay. city living, lack of parking, possibly college on a budget. Yeah, but, that's another good one. Yeah, so let's back it up. Just give me demographic descriptions for the mini car owner. Just demographics. Age, income, gender, ethnicity, education levels. Let's go with gender. That's an easy one. More likely male or female? I say for that first one, be, be a female. Because men are more masculine. They, they need bigger, better, better. Not all and men, but yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. No, I, thank you. Thank you. That's good, Matthew. Let's hear from somebody else. So I, we, got, we got the gender. How about, uh, how about uh, let's see, age, income, gender, uh, education level. Somebody other than Matthew, because he's about to unmute himself. <laughs> There's really no wrong answers, guys. We're just kind of practicing. College age female. I would say somebody who's really into a, a, a smart car or a small car, you know, might have a little more money to kind of make this like uh, environmentally conscious decision about the type of car they drive, you know, so, and they have the luxury of they're able to get around with a smaller car, almost like a roadster or a sports car. They don't need the utility of like somebody who's got kids and like budget is a concern and you know, utilitarian, able to haul stuff around. That's why I need my car. This isn't that type of car. So Reese, nice work there. Yeah, ages 18 to 26, high school or college, female. Now we're getting into demographics. Now we're getting into demographics. So you wanna uh, understand that they're distinct, demographics from psychographics. And you really wanna have a clear understanding before you start writing any copy or, or promoting your product, who's your customer? Who's your target market? Who are they demographically and psychographically? All right, I'm gonna go back to the presentation. Good work on that. Yeah, we'll just, sorry, can I, can I interrupt you real quick? Can you go, go again or can you explain again what the psychographic is again? Absolutely. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Thank you, Matt. So demographics are clear, you know, it's almost like um, they're putting you in a box. You're this age, you make this much money, you live in this neighborhood, you have this much education. So you're, it's, it's a very discreet description of, of somebody. Psychographics are, uh, you could be like, like maybe you're Harley Davidson. And okay, we're like uh, demographically say it's, it's, it's male. Um, it's actually income of probably 75,000 plus because they're not cheap. Um, but 
psychographically, it's they value ruggedness and power and freedom and independence and they're irreverent, right? So those are psychographic descriptions for a Harley Davidson buyer and user. So psychographics are, are, are softer, more adjective kind of based descriptions of a target versus demographics, which are like specific age, income, gender, ethnicity, education level stuff. Does that help? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Okay. So this is kind of like our starting gate before you write copies, you really want to think about, okay, who is my target audience? How do I describe them? We could take somebody like the pickup truck, uh, whereas the mini is going to be female, the pickup truck, although there's lots of girls like trucks too, but predominantly uh, men, uh, predominantly younger, uh, you know, a higher income can afford a big ass truck. So, you know, those are kind of some basic descriptions, but the, the net thing I want you to get out of segmentation is segmentation is about the different customer segments. The products are the result of segmentation. That's the main difference. I am in the interest of time because I'm at 223. I'm going to skip these slides, but I'm going to encourage you to go through and look at these. I've got some more examples on product, differentiating by product price, place, and promotion. I'm gonna skip those. You can look at the Google Slides on your own. But I do wanna spend a little bit of time on the promotional mix. So know this, because this is gonna be on your quiz. The marketing mix and the promotional mix are not the same thing. The marketing mix is like your level one. How are we gonna differentiate? Product, pricing, distribution, place or promotion. The promotional mix, this is what most people think marketing is. Oh, this is what you do. You're in marketing, you must do ads or you work for a PR firm or you know, you're a salesman, salesperson, or you do sales promotion. The promotional mix is one part of marketing. Uh, and this is the promotional mix. When a company is doing all four of these, we call that an integrated marketing campaign. I'd encourage you to click on this link, not now, but the link in this slide is uh, to Real California Cheese. Yes, our own state. And this is an integrated campaign where the dairy board, which is basically the marketing arm for all the dairy farmers in California, which there are many, uh, is promoting uh, California dairy. And who do you think used to be the main cheese, uh, the, the state most known for, for quality cheese prior to our California cheese campaign. Wisconsin. Definitely Wisconsin. So through this integrated marketing campaign, the Dairy Board increased California cheese sales by like 70% year over year, which is just crushing it. And they had advertising, billboards and TV spots. They had uh, tasting samples. They had uh, a ton of sales promotion and point of purchase displays. So you can watch this video and this will come up later in the course. We'll actually do this as an assignment. But this is an example of an integrated marketing campaign where you're kind of using all of the promotional mix elements. It's super complicated uh, to have all these moving parts, but in this case, it was super successful. Well, let me ask you this, just as a sidebar question, you probably remember the old California dairy ads, Got Milk? And the milk mustaches and celebrities with milk mustaches. And the dairy board used to focus on uh, promoting drinking more milk. The dairy board doesn't even make cheese. Those are separate manufacturers altogether. They sell the milk to the cheese manufacturers who then do all the stuff they do to make it into cheese. So why would the dairy board decide to promote cheese? which isn't even their product. I'm gonna unshare here for a second so I can see the chat. That would create a separate revenue stream, correct? That's part of it. 
But let, let, let me put it another way. If you think about milk, some of you drink milk, my kids drink milk, I try to not drink milk, but if milk was 80% off for the month of September, would you double down, triple down, quadruple down on your milk purchasing? How much more milk can you drink and store and not have go sour um, in the course of a week? Not too much, right? Oh, okay. So, no, none. Yeah, so what the dairy board figured out is, you know what, milk is, is what we call a staple product and it's stable, meaning it doesn't spike too much in demand regardless of how cheap or available it is. So if we wanna sell more milk, we're not gonna get it by selling, by promoting milk. We need to sell something, we need to promote something else. And in this case, it's a business to business strategy. If they, if they get the cheese manufacturers to sell more cheese, they're gonna sell more milk. Cause it's, uh, I forget the ratio. I think it's like 10 gallons of milk to make one pound of cheese. So a little bit of lift in cheese production sales results in a huge increase in dairy sales. So they got smart. And also we know that cheese doesn't take up as much space in the fridge. Um, it doesn't spoil as, as rapidly. There's a lot of different types of cheese that it can go into. So they, they actually work with these separate manufacturers to promote their product, which in turn help them sell more cheese. And sales went up in it as a result. That's like a cross promotion. It's, it's a, well, it's a, a good question, Reese. It's actually, we would call that a business to business strategy. We make this thing that goes into somebody else's thing that they in turn sell to the final consumer. So if maybe you, maybe you sell bumpers that go into cars, right? And uh, in order to sell more bumpers, Ford has to sell more cars. So this is, this is that example. And they figured out we're, we're promoting the wrong product. We need to, we need to focus on helping our, our manufacturing customers, cheese manufacturers sell more cheese and then we'll get the lift there. So sometimes your customer isn't the final consumer. Oftentimes your biggest way to increase your sales is to focus on uh, the business sector. So this is the same model that McAfee used then for McAfee anti uh, antiviruses with Microsoft. Exactly. Let's just make it part of the o, o, you know, original equipment manufacturer and just install it in there and we'll get them on the subscriptions when they come in, you know, for the annual renewal. Yeah, exactly. And all, you know, I would say Apple's also per, um, pursuing that strategy with their apps. You know, they figured out, you know, it will make money. Um, we're going to provide the apps like at cost and then, you know, get the money off of those being the platforms of choice until they get super sued like they are right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you can see um, the marketing piece, you know, is there's a lot of like walk before you run and step back, consider our strategy, who we're really going after versus racing to digital media and trying to promote yourself and say, everybody's my customer. I'm just going to promote, you know, put yourself out there. Oftentimes the strategic piece will help you have better sales faster. Ooh, my alarm just went off. Tell me I need to stop on this piece. Let me check where I'm at on slides. I apologize for bouncing back and forth. But. So check out that example. And we're actually okay. Next week, I am going to use this as kind of our leap off point. So we will do this piece next week where we'll do a little bit deeper dive on the promotional mix. And you can see I've got some examples here, slides 15 through, I'm going to note these for my follow-up, 15 through 18, where we'll do some, uh, try to find examples of companies that are differentiating by product or by price, low price or high price, place, how they distribute, or promotion. So that'll be a next week opener. Okay, good stuff, good discussion. Appreciate you guys on that. So let's get into the segment examples. We're gonna do a Zoom breakout. So I've got eight examples here, and I'm just gonna walk through this real quickly. In the chat, I'm gonna do the, I see you've got some examples of coming up with broad categories, that's great. So you're getting an idea there. 
what I'm looking for now is the, <clears throat> bear with me. I need to get you the segmentation breakout exercise worksheet. So I'm gonna copy that and put it in the chat. Stop share. This link going into the chat right now, that's that worksheet, same as we did last week. Not your sign-in sheet, you guys signed in at the beginning. This is, you're gonna break out into groups here in a few minutes, and you're each gonna be assigned a different um, sector, and you're gonna try to figure out who's the user, uh, you know, and, and get some basic segmentation skills around that. So that's, that's your worksheet. So save that as a new link, and your note taker will inputting your names of your group members, and also your notes for that. So make sure you keep tabs when I split you out into groups. Let me show you the eight different sectors real quick. And then you will be assigned accordingly. Share this 132. Present. So one category is bicycles. So what are the different types? So as a group, you're going to figure out what are the different types of bikes. Again, that's the result of segmentation, not necessarily the different targets. Who are the users of each type? So that is the target market. What are the needs of each user? So like what, what, what do they need in a bicycle? So for example, like mountain bikes on the bottom right here. The user, that's going to be predominantly male, probably a younger male, um, you know, under 55, they need a rugged, tough bike with some pretty good suspension. Depending upon if they're hard tail or not. So that's bikes. Cereal, cold cereal. Yeah, that's a big category. Uh, what are the types of cereal? For example, you have granola, you've got gluten free, you've got sugar bomb cereal. Who are the users of each type and what are their needs of each type? So classify, come up with the different categories. And you know, three, four categories is fine. You don't need to overdo it with too many different categories. Uh, who's the user of each category? This is for the note taker in the group. And then what would be kind of the needs of each user? So for like kids are like, we want sugar, 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 energy, sugar. <laughs> um, hard alcohol for the drinkers. Didn't want to forget you. Uh, what are the types? Of, of hard, and we're talking hard alcohol, so not, not beer and wine, so alcohol and spirits. What are the different categories? Are there different users? What's, what's uh, go ahead and unmute if you want to give me, what's the new hot um, alcohol beverage that's coming out? Like every single manufacturer seems to have a version of it. Gluten free. That's one. There's another one. Oh, um, like the uh, seltzer. Yeah. yeah, seltzers. Everybody's jumping on the seltzer bandwagon. I was, taught, I was uh, doing a seminar with the marketing director for Carl Strauss, and they were, they're coming out with a, uh, a, a seltzer, and it's based on the uh, Endless Summer surfing movie. All right, so group one, your bikes. Group two, your cereal, cold cereal. Group three, your alcohol. Group four, motorcycles. Five, fitness classes. Yes, that's a picture of goat yoga. Yes, it's a real thing. Group six, grocery stores. Different types of grocery stores. Group seven, cold remedies. And group eight, lodging. And that's the ice hotel in Russia. And yes, that's a real place. All right, we got our, we got our categories. So we've got uh, 235, we're actually right on schedule. I'm gonna break you out into eight groups. So remember your breakout number and then I'll pop into each group and assign you your sector category. Make sense? Questions? All right, within your group, you're gonna want a note taker. You're gonna want someone to help lead the group on moderating the discussion. And you got 10 minutes to moderate within your group. So about two minutes per person uh, you'll have the presenter, which is sharing out your findings after the group meets. And I'm also going to ask for a new role, which is the timekeeper. So we'll have 10 minutes on this one. All right. Introduce yourselves, set your roles, uh, have those slides open. 
from the lecture, so you can revisit those. And breakout rooms, here we go. All right, before I do this, I'm just gonna read off the names. So breakout room one, if you wanna jot this down, Karen O, Miguel Velasquez, Reese Bader, and Samuel Machado. Breakout room two, Arlene Mendez, Bernie Martinez, Jake Brummett, and Waylon Yorba. Group three, Andrew, Sabrina, Shea Stoltz, and Shelby Messier. Group four, Alex Hughes, Donnie Cardenas, Michaela Escamilla, and Nairumi. Five, Emily, Josh Dent, Perla Enriquez, Sofia Urena. Six, Kelly Johnson, Kevin Urban, Matthew DeBalk, and Yumi Matsui. Seven, Brady, Cole, Tatro, and JR. Simon, there's only three of you, but you'll figure it out. Uh, group eight, Christian Solis, Jared Young, and Genevieve Dance. Here we go. Give it a minute. All right, is uh, Brady, Jared, and Alex, you guys not in a group? Go ahead and un unmute yourself, Brady. Unmute yourself. Yeah, my bad, we're in seven. You're in I seven, okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm in your group. I must've accidentally gotten in your group. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna close this. Okay, that's good. You're in your group. For some reason, it's, I don't know why it's showing, I can still see you. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not actually in. Oh, I got you. I see you. I have Jared in here. And okay, I got you. You and Jared. That's it. I'm going to put you into group six because it looks like we don't have enough people. So I'm going to put you back into six. Okay. You're going cool. to like interrupt them, but go ahead and introduce yourself and tell them that I did it. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Okay. Move to six. You should be in six now. Hmm. Jared Young, how about you? Technical difficulties. If you leave the group, Brady, I can put you back in. How do I do that? Uh, look for a leave, leave button down at the bottom. Oh, here we go. Leave meeting? Leave meeting. Okay. All right. One second here. Jared, I'm going to get back to you in a second. Okay, so breakout room one. Because I have no idea. Hey. Breakout.